Yeah, sorry, I went off air. I don't know why. Everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was saying that sorry, my my line went off. I don't know why. But um we were just talking about how um why infection prevention is important for our families, for ourselves. Uh -huh and the patients. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. So we need to, the first rule of being in the world is that we need to consider everyone and everything infectious. That means your elevator, uh, the rails when you are going upstairs, the files, the linen of the patient, the patients themselves. Everything you touch should be regarded as um, infectious. That is important. Then the other thing that is important is that um, when you know that everything is infectious, then you need, um, can we mute please? Can we mute ourselves? Yeah, you need to, to understand after you understand that everything is infectious, you need to find a way to to protect yourself. So there are different ways of protecting yourself. The first one we want to start with is just that you need to be vaccinated. There's COVID vaccination, there's hepatitis B vaccinations. Those are the ones that uh, we are talking about um, at this time. So if you haven't had a hepatitis vaccination, it's something that you need to do because you'll be on the ward your whole life probably. So you are more likely to get uh, infected and therefore we need to have uh, these uh, uh, vaccinations done. Um, I think the one, the vaccination that is available for hepatitis is, the, is that first one, the three dose one. So you just need to find where to get it. If the hospital doesn't have it, if your university doesn't provide it, I think it's worth um, paying this particular one uh, for yourself. So we've talked about COVID, we've talked about hepatitis vaccinations. Um, then the next thing about protecting yourself is um, when you have an accident. I asked this question in the last exam that um, uh, the um, Apex and the, I think even Levy medical students had uh, that if you have maybe a like a splash, what is the procedure in the hospital? And many of the people didn't know the procedure, a few knew. Um, this is what this slide is about. So when you have a needle prick, you have a splash of lycra in your eyes, you have a splash of lycra in the mouth, in the, anyway, you need to take these precautions first. The first thing you need to do is um, that you need to inform your supervisor or the most senior person available. So you inform them that you have had a needle prick, you have had a lycra splash in your eyes and so on. After you inform your supervisor, the next step, of course, is usually that they'll talk to you, they'll try to calm you down, then they'll get blood from you or they'll ask someone, they'll delegate for someone to get blood from you and get from the patient. Then the blood, your blood or the blood of the person who has had an accident will be tested for, for HIV, to be tested for hepatitis B. If uh, hepatitis C is possible, it will also be tested. Then you also be, the patient will also be tested with the same things. Meanwhile, if you've had this splash, you need to go to the tap, of course. Wash 
your eyes if the, with running water, if your eyes have been splashed, uh, wash the place where you've pricked yourself with a needle. And they usually say, do not squeeze, but just wash that place with um, running water. They usually say, don't squeeze because you might squeeze the virus in or something. I don't know how much evidence is there on that, but they say just clean the place with running water and soap generally, but do not squeeze. With the eyes, you also wash your eyes with running water. Then your blood has gone for a test. When it comes back, if you are positive and the patient is negative, usually you go in the path of, um, you need to go to the ART clinic where you'll be canceled. And then you start, um, you have your preliminary tests, you know, the tests that we do before somebody starts um, uh, HIV treatment. So those are done, liver function tests and so on, then you start. If you are found negative, and the patient is positive, then you need to go on post-exposure uh, prophylaxis and so on. Um, usually somebody, if you inform your supervisor, somebody knows where the lab is for you to go and get the tests. Uh, they know where the specimen bottles are and they know where the drugs are available where the pharmacies and the emergency drugs if the pharmacy is closed, where have they been put? Somebody has the keys are for those things. Because once you prick yourself, time is ticking and the um, drug should be taken as soon as possible. But if it's delayed for some reason, for some good reason it's delayed, it should not go beyond uh, 72 hours. So that is the procedure for someone who has had a, an accident, exposure to an infection. In this case, we are talking about hepatitis B and HIV. Um, then the other thing that we should do to protect ourselves is just have the correct, uh, the correct attire. So our attire should match what we are doing on the ward. So these are examples of different attires that we see. And we can see that people have different attires depending on the job that they do. But I think that we take the hospital for granted. We are not gloved. We, are, we don't have proper shoes. The shoes are open, blood can seep in. We don't have masks. We don't have goggles. Uh, we don't have caps and so on. So these are things that we need to make sure we have. And this is, we call this, um, personal protective clothing. And I think we need to stress the fact that this is personal protective clothing. Personal means that you are taking responsibility for it. No one is going to take responsibility for your health. So it's personal, this protection you are putting on yourself. So you make sure that you have all the gadgets that are needed to do the job uh, that you are doing. Then the other thing is hand washing. There's a proper procedure for washing hands. It has five steps generally. So you need to just go to your YouTube, um, Google, WHO or CDC hand washing. The hand washing we are talking about is not the hand washing we do when, when we are about to eat in Shima. This hand washing is for making sure you don't carry infection from one patient to the next. So we need to be aware of these steps. Your homework or your responsibilities to look for that CDC video or that WHO video on hand washing on the ward. So just look at it and see the steps for washing hands, making sure all the fingers are cutted for, the both surfaces of your hand are cutted for, the nails, uh, the area between the fingers, the tips of the fingers, that's the whole idea that all the surfaces are washed. Um, because patients get infection when we move from one patient to the next. And if our hands are not washed, we're actually carrying infection from one patient to another. So for this slide, that is where your homework is. Then this is a slide on the five moments of hygiene. So the World Health Organization has studied at what portions we healthcare workers transmit infections to, 
to patients. And these are the moments that we should wash our hands before any procedure like putting a cannula, before putting a, a catheter in a patient, you should wash your hands. After touching a patient, you should wash your hands. After touching the patient surroundings, the table, the files, the bed, all those things, you should wash your hands. After having contact with uh, body fluids of the patient, you should wash your hands. Sometimes you lift up your, the urine bag to check the level and you don't go and wash your hands. We should wash our hands in all those situations. And also before touching a patient, we should wash our hands. So these are called the five moments of hygiene. So if you get a question, what are the five moments of hygiene? These are the points or what's the definition of the five moments of hygiene? These are the points at which you wash hands on the word, the occasions where you have to wash hands on the words. So these are the five moments of hygiene. Um, then we move on to proper disposal of waste um, in the hospital. So you know that when we are in the hospital, we have clinical waste and we have non-clinical waste and we have um, uh, bio waste. So bio waste are things like, um, you know, you've done an amputation, you've removed the, um, an organ and it's not going for histopathology for some reason. Sometimes you do a hysterectomy and the nurse asks, uh, doctor, are you going to, what do we do with this specimen? Or sometimes it's a placenta. What are we going to do with this specimen? So all that is bio waste. So that is the kind of waste that we are, um, generating on the word and it has a place where it goes. So the first place is the, um, that yellow, that bin, that bin, which has a yellow bin liner. So we all see that on the word. So that is where the, the infectious waste goes. Then the black bin liner is where the non-infectious waste goes. This black, uh, this bin that is lined in black is also called um, uh, municipal waste or council waste. So other people have a four bin system, but what we have on our words is a three bin system. So we have a place where we put infectious waste. We have a place where we put um, non-clinical waste, which is um, cancer waste. And we have a place, the red one, the most infectious, where we put um, sharps. So when we are on the word, this, our, um, the waste that we are generating is graded like that. The, bio, the biological waste usually goes in the sluice. And then after that, it goes to the incinerator. If you're in the rural health center, usually they will just maybe bury it. Some people bury it. But ideally, um, all biological waste goes to the incinerator, and that's where it's bent. The non-infectious waste, which are like the bottles of Coca-Cola that you are using, sometimes it's plastics where the gloves came from, they all go in the middle. And then the things we used on the patients go in the yellow lined container then the sharps go in the sharp box. So that's a three bin system that we have, but you could have a four bin system if you liked. So if you are using gloves, you know the, um, the cover for the gloves, the paper for the gloves, there's an inside paper, all those things can go in the black bin because it's still from the word, that, that thing. But things like Coca-Cola bottles that are generated on the word should have their own bin but it looks like on the word, we just have a three bin system. So even some Coca-Cola bottles find themselves in the, in the black lined bin liner, uh, in the black lined bin. So the black lined bin, the council comes and they pick the waste and they go and throw it away. So the middle bin, it's council waste. So council come and they pick it and take it away. Then the yellow bin, everything in the yellow bin goes to the incinerator. Everything in the red bin, which is a sharp box, uh, also goes to the incinerator. So this is what 
is happening to the disposable things that we are using or the waste that we are generating on the world. Then um, there are those things that we are using on the world that we are not throwing away, the things that are not disposable. So those things, we have to process them. So the first thing you need to know that we have three kinds of instruments on the world. We have critical instruments, we have semi-critical instruments, and we have non-critical instruments. Critical instruments are instruments we are using in sterile areas. Semi-critical instruments are instruments we are using in mucous membranes and intact, non-intact skin. And non-critical instruments are instruments we are using on intact skin. So semi-critical instruments, we have examples there, you know, like your penguin suckers, um, things that you are putting in the mouth of the patients, uh, maybe endotracheal tubes, um, you've, you've seen all those scopes that are there, rectoscopes, all those are semi-critical instruments. Non-critical instruments are things like your stethoscopes, your BP machine, your ECG uh, leads, those things that just have contact with non-intact skin. And then you have the critical instruments. Those are instruments you are using in sterile body cavities. So when you have, an, when you have a critical instrument, ideally, that instrument should be sterilized before it's used on the next patient. If you have semi-critical instruments, it's adequate to high level disinfect it before it, it is used on the next patient. If you have non-critical instruments, you can low level disinfect it, meaning that you just wipe it with alcohol. If you have um, your spirit or any alcohol that is about 70%, you can just use um, cotton to wipe that instrument and it can be used on the next patient. High level disinfection is another thing. It removes all viruses or uh, fungus, but it fails to remove uh, bacterial endospores. Sterilization on the other hand, removes bacteria, viruses, and bacterial endospores, meaning that uh, sterilized instruments are free of any microorganisms on them. So that is about the reason why we divide instruments that we use on the word into critical, semi-critical, and non-critical, it's for us to know how to process them so that they, are, they can safely be used on the, on the next patients. Then, um, so how do we process uh, instruments? The steps are that once you use an instrument, you have to decontaminate it first. So on the words, what we normally do is that we put the instruments, if you've been observing, uh, we put the instruments in 0.5% um, jig solution, and it's there for five to 10 minutes. Yeah, no one keeps a watch. So just say five to 10 minutes. And then the, the reason we are decontaminating is that we want to reduce the, the microbial, load on the instruments because those instruments are supposed to be cleaned. So just imagine that you are cleaning a very sharp instrument and it has not been decontaminated. It means all the viruses, all the bacteria are there. So if you prick yourself, everything goes into your blood system. So decontamination reduces that microbial load so that it's, it's safer for the one who's cleaning the instrument and cleaning uh, the technical meaning of cleaning is it's removing the um, visible debt on an instrument. So you are removing the visible debt on an instrument, meaning you are removing um, blood. You are removing uh, tissue on the instruments. Then that is what is called cleaning. Then after the instrument is cleaned, it's dried. It's dried, then it's packed. Then it's taken for high level disinfection or sterilization, depending, depending on whether that instrument is critical or semi-critical. So you can see there are different kinds of, there are different kinds of um, high level disinfection. We have boiling for 20 minutes, steaming for 20 minutes, being in chlorine 0.1% for 20 minutes, putting something in, um, I think two to 4% side decks for 20 minutes, that is 
high level disinfection. Then you have um, sterilization. You can use radiation. The common thing we are using on the on the ward is, is uh, the autoclave machine. So we take it to theater where the autoclave is, and then it's done from there. Then you can also use Sidex, uh, two to eight percent. You put something uh, in Sidex for eight to twelve hours, and then that. Um, that instrument becomes sterilized. So Sidex 2 to 4%, I think, and for 8 to 12 hours, that instrument will get sterilized. So that is how we sterilize instruments on the wards, and that's how we, we do um, high-level disinfection. Yeah, so this is what we've been talking about, and that's how we process the instruments. So, I don't know if anyone has uh, some questions. We have about eight minutes for this presentation. So does anyone have uh, some infection prevention questions? Does anyone have some pre, uh, infection prevention questions? Or am I talking to myself? I think it was clear, Doc. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. So, so that that is that. Um. So let me just go back because yeah, so we talked about all these things. So just remember that your homework, you might find this in your OSCE station where we say, wash your hands. You're about to, to put a cannula on this patient. Can you wash your hands? So don't take that for granted. I've given you, I don't know if it's an answer or it's a question, but it's something that you have to know, the procedure for proper washing of hands before you, you touch a patient. Okay, so if everyone has understood, um, there's no problem. So, I think let's have like a five minutes break, this six minutes, then we, we rejoin because it's cutting in six minutes. So you can have this six minutes or we need to, to rejoin again for the second one. I think it would take maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes, then it means we are done. Yeah, I'll, I'll post this one too. Yeah, maybe yeah, before I post, um, there was another question in um, the previous group. Again, I'm giving you some ideas um, about the coming uh, test or exam. So the question was that, um, what, what, what is proper handling of sharps? So the answers are so many to that question. So what is called proper handling of sharps? We've already talked about sharps going in the, in the sharp box. Uh, you know those issues about how you should not recap needles and all those things. So just um, look up how you should properly, you should properly handle sharps. I think that's another, the second homework. I almost forgot about that second homework because it's a, it was a question in the last uh, OSCE exam, uh, Apex and Levy. How do you, what are the rules for proper handling of sharps? How sharps should not be given to another person? If that is supposed to be done, it should be, through some container of some sort, maybe a kidney dish, some receptacle of some, of some kind. So all these things, I think that you are supposed to know. 
um, and uh, be aware about. So that's that's the other the other thing that that we need we need to know. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. And if there are no questions, I think I'll end the meeting because it will end anyway. So that uh, in five minutes or whatever time people rejoin and we, we start over. Yeah. Thank you. So we just rejoin, yeah, and do that 10 to 15 minutes. I'm just going quickly through it because like I said, I did this tutorial, but it was with, I think it was just with one group. Okay. Yeah, so let's just rejoin in three or four minutes. <laughs>